Okay. Let's talk, let's talk about Trump's economic policy. I'm just going to parrot J.D. Vance on this one because okay. the, the vice presidential debate just happened, right? And he made the key point. The net income of individuals relative to buying power was up during Trump's time. Right. What else do you need to know? Right. Right. Pre-COVID, before COVID hit. See, the challenge, the challenge with a lot of the stats are, and, and look, I don't, the two candidates are, are exhausting. I want it to be over and done with. I'm tired, boss. I, I think the majority of America could agree with that. Yeah. And I don't agree with the antics that come along with Trump. The stats, though, that are used when you talk about like, oh, Trump lost this many jobs. That's that's not true. It's actually false. I know the data like the back of my hand. Yeah, we're in the middle of a pandemic. But it's here- just like you can't say Biden, you know, you, like there's there's a, a three year kind of like during covid that COVID has to be accounted for. Correct. And and actually, it's it's interesting because if you look at, you can go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and see this data yourself. Trump leaving office, the recovery was explicit. Right. And palpable. It was massive. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at like job, job rates, unemployment rates are plummeting and the labor force skyrockets as right. Trump's leaving office. That rate of growth of the job market actually slows as Biden comes in. And it never recovers to pre-COVID levels. Right. So, yeah, it drops because you shut the economy down. Yeah. Okay. And mind you, he was being ostracized for how long it took him to do that. Yeah. He was being killed. Well, I mean, look, during, in the moment, I, I was even on that train. Everybody was. Yeah. Right? So. This was, this was, the only time that I was a Trump fan was when he didn't shut the economy down. During his presidency. Because, look, my voting record is pretty I- implicit. It was yeah, yeah. Obama, Obama, Clinton, Biden. It's right. just, it's going to be Trump. I'll put that out there now. It's not like, you, and it's only going to be that because I'm looking at the data. Like, it's just imp- empirical, mm-hmm. right? I'm not saying I'm a big so, Trump fan. I like the way he talks, any of that crap. I just no, like people being like, wealthy. If you, but that's the challenge, right? If you say anything bad about Kamala it immediately puts you in this camp of you're a Trumper. Yeah, you're a lifer, you're racist, you're this, you're, it's it. just crazy. That's the cha- like, I just want to be able to make an informed decision without feeling like I've got all these labels that come along with it. Mm-hmm. Because I think when I, when I really look at the two candidates and I look at Kamala versus Trump and what they both stand for, and what they both are proposing, I want to just pick the decision or the the best plan. Right. Right. But if you pick one, it's a lot of people, I feel like who are very, very like pro Kamala are just very, very anti Trump. Or or and this is something you and I've talked about is. I've had to do a lot of soul searching in the past I'm going to call it 24 months and in rewriting of my own history, because the it, it may not be that they also don't know Kamala. They might also just be subject to what has been an all out straight up media attack yeah. against Trump. Yeah. And again, I am not a massive fan of Donald That's Trump. I, like- I'm not. But. When I go back and I watch, like I sent one today, we had another video where we were like, oh, the bleach comment Trump made. And I was like, you know what? I never went back to actually find that clip. I went back to find it. He literally never said it. He never said it. Really? He never said no it. No way. I'm dead ass serious. I Hold watched. On, we need to run the clip. Then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. Right. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute. One minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of lungs. So it would be interesting to check that. So that you're going to have to use 
medical doctors with, but it sounds, it sounds interesting to me. Okay. And so even now that I'm going and I'm rewriting my own, because I, yeah. I watched our video back where you were like, you know, the bleach comment was unnecessary. And, and yeah. uh, Khalil was like, yeah, da, 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 da. And I was like, but it was a kind of a funny thing to say, right? And I was like, okay. let me go back and chart, check. And it, it's not we'll, there. We'll play it. And he says, just inject bleach into you. And he's kidding. But it's actually he has kind of funny. Millions of Americans watching who have no idea what's true or not. Yeah. And you have the president of the United States going, oh, okay. And so it's just, it's mind blowing to me that we yeah. get into this point. But again, I, I, I'm not saying, he, his problem is that he's not presidential in that traditional no, his presidential problem, sense. His problem is that he says things for shock value. Yeah. That's not not presidential. Okay. You're saying it's even further than not presidential. Yeah. You are the face of the United States. Yep. And you know things, you know that you are addressing millions of people. Uh -huh. So you don't address you, them in an inclusive way, like a way that it, that welcomes them in. It's not an invitation. Correct. Yeah, that's one element of it. But when you intentionally say things that are divisive or can be taken out of context are are exaggerative because we know Trump exaggerates things. Yeah. Right. It's confusing. Okay, can I ask you a question on sure. this though? Because we both come from a rich corporate world. Yeah. Right? Is that not just a byproduct of that? Do you know the number no. of CEOs that I've seen that operate in that exact same way? You, you, but you realize I am I am a person who writes the talking points for these CEOs. And they still say this shit. They, a lot of them don't though. You're saying be the one that doesn't? Yeah. Fair enough. I can get behind that. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I, I understand what you're saying. And like. I, you have, and just in a corporate world, you have a responsibility and an, and you need to have an understanding that anything that you say is going to get picked apart. Of course. Right? And in, in the he case of a corporate it. world, it's 100,000 people. People advise him yeah. on it he and he doesn't give a fuck. That's the problem with Trump. Yeah. yeah. He, he For the record, be, that's why Nadia says she's always worried about me. Oh my God. <laughs> the, the only saving grace I'd say in this election is J.D. Vance. My guy. Because that man impressed me at the the vice presidential My debate. guy. Like, I'm at this point right now. I was like, J.D. who? Before. <laughs> right. Like, who the fuck is this guy? And I'm glad that he introduced himself at the beginning because I also was like, who are you? Right, right, right. I, and, I mean, Tim just looked scared. Oh, my God. <laughs> here's, here's where I'm at, right? I think... Kamala and Trump are both equally not fit to be president. Can I vote on? I'm now voting on VP. Yes. And based on the performance at the vice presidential debate, J.D. Vance demolished him. Can I add to that? Sure. And I've heard a couple people say this as well. I said this to you during the debate. Uh, I think I said something to the effect of finally. Finally, we got a gentleman. Just a gentleman's debate. Like when, when someone tells you about their son being witness to a shooting. Right. Before you respond, it's not that J.D. Vance didn't attack that, which is, you know, in itself, like yeah, now you worry about that. You need to take a moment to recognize what someone just said to you. Yeah. And what did he say? Tim, first of all, I didn't know that your 17-year-old witnessed a shooting. And I'm sorry about that. And I, I hope appreciate that you're doing you okay. So. Christ have mercy. Uh, it is it is awful. And moved on to have an argument. He was like, I and and I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. But this is the humanity that I want to see out of a leader. And this is where I very much agree with you on Trump, because that's the humanity I often don't see. Mm -hmm. um, and as We've much as you can be an them. effective true, true, actually, true, right? As much as you can be an effective decision maker about foreign policy, economics, business, whatever it might be, when you're the when you're the face of 330 million people, and and we talked about inflation, but I would actually retract my previous statement that that's our biggest problem right now. I think it's our second biggest problem. I think our biggest problem is that America, we, the United States, this people, 
used to be the reflection of good moral values that existed in the world. And, and look, you might not think that, but that's just because we started to rewrite history. Like Elon Musk said something beautiful in a podcast one time. He's like, you know, post-World War II, we sent resources to rebuild Europe. We didn't have to do no, that. No, the but argument is for everyone, it hasn't been that. What do you mean for everyone, it hasn't been that? I mean, the argument is more around, like, if you ask the black community if America has been the staple of opportunity for everybody, then the answer is no. It Actually, there's a huge contention among that in the black community. America, from the beginning of the civil rights movement until the late 1900s, was a beacon of hope and progress for the black community. The compounded rate of wealth growth in the black community up until the 90s was multiplicatively higher than any other group in the United States. Right. I, I hear you. I hear you. The civil rights movement, pre. Yeah. Not so much. But again, this is a rewriting of history. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm just America saying... eradicated slavery. One of the first nations ever to do this. Yeah. Like you can look at a problem and say, oh, you were doing this thing wrong, right? But everyone was doing the thing wrong. Who decided to change the momentum? Yeah. In, in, in slavery America, there were 3,700, but this is a fact, 3,700 black Americans that owned 12,000 slaves. This was the norm of the time. I'm not saying it was good. I'm not saying it was acceptable. But do you choose to tell yourself the history of the acceptable norms that occurred throughout history? Because slavery had been a thing for all time prior to that. Or do you choose to tell yourself the story of overcoming something that was an accepted norm and an evil for all time? You know what's so interesting? We started this section talking about Trump's economic policy. Yeah. We haven't talked about Trump's economic policy. Let's talk about because, Trump's economic policy. No, no, no. Right. What's interesting is when you when you try to talk about something that Trump is proposing in his plan, there's all of this other stuff mm. that's blocking it. Yeah. And you and it's and hard you can't even to get, get to... past that other stuff. It's it's kind of like ironically. Okay, here's the real irony. That's that's a very interesting thought, and I'm glad you said that. Because it's kind of like what we were just talking about, about the story you wrote, right? Trump is so divisive in all yeah. these other areas that you can't even get to the good yeah. about him. Our history is so divisive that you can't even get to, to the do. good about it. Like, I mean, here's his economic policy. Stop taxing. Unlock the economy. Stop and, and restri- misconception about the taxing piece, my understanding at least is, mm-hmm. it's not stop taxing corporations. No. It's reduce taxes in general. Yes, but right. for the right things. Right. Right? You you don't want you, you want to incentivize people to invest in a few things. Pay their people more. Mm-hmm. Invest in production in the United States. Right. right? So g- give corporations benefits for investing in the United States, which is where you come into, and then make other people pay. Yeah. Right? And so there's this whole thing about Trump's sales tax on America. His big yeah, program I'm actually a little terror. confused about this. Okay, time, so, so effectively what he's saying is I'm going to start putting tariffs on everything. Right. And a tariff is effectively, effectively a tax on an imported good. Right. Okay? Here's what that does. It raises the cost of goods production. Right? And so what that does is it makes it much more expensive to, to produce goods elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And the argument against tariffs, and this is coming from somebody who throughout their entire economics career was a big proponent of globalization, low tariffs. I've changed that over my life. And the argument against it is that you're raising the cost of goods, the input cost of goods, which hurts the people locally. Right. Here's the counter argument to it. You're making it competitive for local companies, resources, et cetera, to produce the goods here, right? right? Now, the fact that our labor costs $15, $20, $30 an hour is competitive against China's labor at $3 an hour. Okay, but are you going to see, an? uh, am I as a a regular American person going to see an increase in my goods 
In the short term. Yes. Okay. But that's the important point in the short term, right? So, but, our but we're goods, in a significant inflation period right now. So is this is this something that that a, a middle class American can handle in the short yes, term? Yes, because with that increase in the cost of goods comes the increase in wages and the increase in jobs that I allows see. you to pay for those goods okay. because your rates of production are now more competitive. And here's the other thing that's more important. You'll have a long run reduction in the cost of goods because we will be incentivized to innovate and optimize and get more efficient. Where China has 1.5 billion people at their disposal, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. So what do we create? Technology, methods, factories, ways to organize and optimize. So you increase technology, you inject it into the American manufacturing system. You're not going to see a reduction in the jobs that come with that because all we're doing is supplementing the fact that we have literally, what is that? 1.5 billion divided by five times less people here in the United States. And we're supplementing that lack of labor with additional technology. Right. Yeah, and that makes sense. The other thing about it is we have 50,000 dock workers going on strike right now. What wouldn't be happening in these times of situations when there are so many other things that we need to produce here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's other issues. Bring it home. Unionization, too. Okay, idea. Shower idea that I had. Okay. What if we taxed companies based on how many people they employ in the United States. So it actually made it more expensive for them to go overseas and outsource work. And they get either a tax reduction or a tax write-off or a credit in some way. And maybe this is how taxes work already. I'm not a tax law person, but then employing more people in the United States is a better decision financially for businesses, also ethically. I don't know, like I don't directly employ people overseas. I indirectly employ people overseas, um, but I'm purchasing those services and goods from US companies. So I purchase uh, like development services okay. from companies that are in the US that have workers overseas. And I don't pay additional taxes for that type of kind of construct. Right, right, right. I don't know if other companies who employ those workers pay and it, it, it is there's got to be some difference because for example there's different tax rates on just even Texas based employees versus Georgia based employees versus California based employees. Well, I but guess my point I more, love the concept. Yeah, my point more is let's not just raise taxes for corporations. Let's incentivize them to make better decisions for the american people but th these because are... that's the that's the thing people aren't trusting big corporations because they don't think that there's a level of accountability so yeah. then don't regulate one dimensionally mm -hmm. regulate the decision and not the act itself here's what else is interesting that that would do though so and i'm just thinking in real time because you're telling me this idea you know the united states used to be uh, we had our pick of the litter of global talent, right? Mm. And what you're talking about is it, it hyper raises the types of incomes and resources over here. And American companies at the end of the day is where global talent wants to work. Mm -hmm. Global talent doesn't have to come to America to work at American companies. And so that type of structure would, in, in theory create a massive incentive for all of that talent to be right size come over here. But what you need to do at the same time is dedicate a ton of resources to immigration and customs to be able to truly process all of these green cards, applications, et cetera, et cetera. The only potential risk I can think of off the top of my head is that it might incentivize companies to leave America. And I don't know to what extent well, it would. But if you coupled it with a tariff on imported goods. Yeah, you'd have to layer it. Pick it apart. Interesting. I don't know. Moral of the story, Nadia produces better ideas that need to be studied in uh, economics 
in the shower than Kamala Harris does while she has those teams of economic advisors. So I'm very proud of you. I appreciate Thank that. Thank you so much. Proud to call you my sister. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> proud to be called your sister. Yeah.